Ninja Guide and Parallax Scrolling. What is it and how does it work? Ninja Gaiden. I'm fairly sure it is Ninja Gaiden, not Ninja Gaiden or even Ninja Garden, but I'm not absolutely certain. However you say it, it's generally accepted as being one of the best games on the NES. It's well remembered by fans and it did make it onto the NES Classic Edition if you're able to find one. It may be seizure inducingly difficult, but it's fun, innovative and it's particularly notable for its complex storyline and its cinematic presentation. It had more than 20 minutes of animated cutscenes and an unusually well fleshed out plot for an 8-bit action game. 20 minutes of cutscenes that barely get you to the character creation screen these days but back then it was a lot and you know what they were extremely well done too they took a lot of inspiration from hollywood manga and anime and used all kinds of clever visual effects to tell the story but one thing that really stands out to me anyway is it's parallax scrolling what is parallax scrolling well it's a visual trick used in 2d games where different parts of the background scroll by at different rates to give the illusion of depth you can see it used here in this very short section of the opening scene where the wind shimmers through this great grassy field and it's used to brilliant effect in this now iconic scene where the camera pans around and the hero Ryu Hayabusa slides into view in front of the distant temple. Parallax scrolling was quite the thing in the late 80s and early 90s. A lot of games featured it and it was a surprisingly big selling point sometimes. What's the gameplay like? Well, it's not great, but it's got 12 layers of parallax. Plus, David Whittaker did the soundtrack and there's boobs on the magazine advert. That's what sold games back in those days. So it's no surprise then that a lot of the more advanced game systems of the era, 16-bit home consoles, arcade machines, had graphics hardware specifically designed to allow for parallax scrolling. The NES, on the other hand, an 8-bit machine from 1983, didn't have any such luxuries. It shouldn't really be able to do parallax scrolling. So how are these effects achieved on a system that was by now fairly long in the tooth? Well, with some clever programming, it was possible to trick the NES's graphics chip into scrolling different parts of the screen at different speeds. Now, it has to be said that the final result was wasn't quite as impressive as what you'd see on those more modern machines. But considering the machine that it was on and considering its hardware limitations, I still think it's pretty impressive. And it makes very ingenious use of the system's scrolling capabilities. You see, the NES does have hardware scrolling. It has the ability to scroll backgrounds horizontally or vertically, in some cases both at once, and at different rates depending on the game. It also has the ability to split the screen into two different sections and scroll them both at different rates. You can see this in action in the main gameplay of Ninja Gaiden. The status bar at the top of the screen stays static like you want it to, whereas the main player field scrolls along with the action as you'd expect. It does this by using an invisible sprite as a sort of trigger, which lets the CPU know when the split needs to occur and when to send a message to the graphics chip to change the scrolling speed. In this case, it changes from the completely static status bar at the top of the screen to the scrolling player field below. So that gives us two sections that can move at different rates. But if we go back to the cutscenes, we can see that there are in fact quite a few more sections moving independently. What's going on? Well, the NES is using scan line counting to split the screen up even further and create more than the two separately moving sections that its hardware is usually capable of. Now, I have spoken about scan lines before, but to remind you, in short, scan lines are horizontal rows of pixels across the screen that are sent one by one by the system to the TV to make up each complete frame of video. This doesn't happen instantly, so it's possible, if you're quick enough, to change the image as it's being drawn. So let's take another look at the opening cutscene in the grass. I've slowed the game right down down in an emulator to show you what's happening. You can see the static background with the moon and the clouds and the trees and below that is the first layer of scrolling grass. This split here with the first change of scrolling speed can be done with the NES's inbuilt invisible sprite trigger trick. For the other layers, the CPU has to manually work out where it needs to change the scrolling rate to get the effect. And to do this, it counts scan lines. Each scan line takes a certain amount of time to be drawn. So if you know how long it takes, you can count up through the scan lines, determine when each part of the screen is being drawn and change the scrolling rate to the appropriate level, giving you those extra scrolling splits. The animation here is of course made up of lots of static images played one after the other, just like any moving image. So for each individual frame that's drawn, you want to know which parts of the screen need to move and which don't. The slowest moving part of this scene moves one pixel every five frames. The fastest one moves one pixel for four out of every five frames. And so by using this scanline counting method, the game's code can determine exactly when it needs to change the scrolling rate to get the desired amount of movement. Do this for all the frames and you've got parallax scrolling, more or less. Now, there is one fairly obvious problem with this method of parallax scrolling. It tends to look rather conveyor belt-like, with a clear delineation between the different layers. Unlike what you'd see on maybe the Super NES or Mega Drive, the different layers here have got to remain separated with this method. 
But there is a couple of ways to get around this, or at least appear to get around this, which works well enough. Looking at the iconic temple scene again, we can see Hero Ryu slide into view on that rocky pinnacle over the other scrolling background layers. That should be impossible with a split screen parallax technique, but it can be done by making use of another of the system's graphical capabilities at the same time. Here, Ryu and the pinnacle are in fact sprites. Sprites are 2D objects laid over the background layer that can move independently relative to each other and relative to the backgrounds. They're usually used to display things like player characters and enemies. And whilst they are of limited size and there's a limited number of them, if you put a lot of them together, you can draw something like Ryu here over the background and it looks pretty good. Now take a look at this slightly earlier section of cutscene from the beginning of Act 4. Here you can see palm trees in the foreground appearing to move over the mountainous backdrop. Again, this looks like it shouldn't be possible, but this time it's not sprites, it's just a sort of optical illusion. There's a scrolling split somewhere on the mountain just above the trees. We've got two separate layers moving independently like they did in the other scenes, but it looks like trees are overlapping with the mountain because it's just a single colour with no texture or detail. It's not so easy to see, but if I edit the graphics a bit and change the layer near the trees, it should be a bit more clear. Now that may be a fairly inelegant edit, but by changing the colour of the mountain next to the trees, you should be able to see that they're all just moving along in a single layer. Now all these techniques work great, they make very clever use of the NES's limited capabilities, and they work well in telling the story. But you may have noticed that this all occurs during cutscenes and not during the actual game. Gameplay. That's because the scanline counting method is quite processor intensive. It takes up a lot of CPU time and it can't really be done in game when so much other stuff has to happen too. But let's have a look at Ninja Gaiden 2, the immediate sequel to the first game. Well, that effect looks pretty similar, but it's happening in game. Looks like they came up with a more efficient way of doing it here. Actually, Ninja Gaiden 2 uses a more advanced cartridge with extra hardware designed for scanline counting. The game's code can set triggers that go off when a certain scanline is reached automatically, without the CPU having to calculate the place where it needs to change the scrolling speed manually. This takes way less processor time and it means it can be done while still allowing other complex actions to occur on the screen. The effect looks identical, but it's easier for the CPU to do. A lot of NES games use this kind of extra circuitry in the cartridge and not just for parallax scrolling effects, but for all kinds of other things too. I may cover that in another episode, but for now, I think that's got to be all about parallax scrolling. It's an oddly interesting topic that's kind of irrelevant now. In modern 3D game engines, the parallax effect is just a natural product of the way it works. And it's not something you'll really see touted as a selling point, even in modern 2D pixel art style games. Another relic of the classic gaming era. If you've got this far, then well done. Thanks for watching. And if you haven't done already, then please subscribe.